Hey, good morning. Welcome. I'm Andy Lee, and this is the Bite of Bread. Come on in. Come to my table. Come get your coffee, your Bible, your journal, something to write with. We got some notes to take today. Come on in. Hey, Judy. Good morning. Good to see you. Lori, good to see you. Come on in. Got my coffee. Hey, Robin. Good morning. I'm glad you could be with us today. Hey, it's early, so maybe it just started for you. Hope you've had some time with the Lord already this morning. So glad you could join me. We are digging deep in the Word, studying what to do if we're married to an unbeliever, how we can minister to them, how and what God says about marriage. This is really interesting today, so we need for a minute. Okay, I'm going to just pray, and, and hopefully it will keep on going. Hold my hands. Julie says, Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday back to you. Hold my hands. Hey, Rick, I'm going to pray us up. Father, we praise you and love you and worship you because you are God and you are good. Lord, we thank you for your grace, your kindness, and your scripture this morning. Just speaks of your grace. You are such a gracious kind, gentle God. And Lord, I do pray for those marriages that are out there where one spouse is a believer and the other is not. I pray for your grace over their marriage. I pray for communication. I pray for softened hearts. And I do pray that one day that spouse would come to know you as Lord and Savior. That is our hope and our plea and our prayer. God, be with me today as I teach this, um, this scripture. I just pray your grace in the teaching. It's in your name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Hi, Elaine. Good morning. So glad you could join me. We are on 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12. Verses 12 and 13. And these are really interesting scriptures. You know, divorce is a big thing in the church. And um, scripture is clear that it's not God's heart for divorce. And marriage is sacred and, and just such a... Um, as just so important to him. We, you know, the Lord even says that he is our husband and that the church is the bride of Christ. So marriage is the the picture of, of God and his church. And so it's so powerful. But God's grace is here. And I think we can really hear it and see it in 1 Corinthians 7, 12 to 13. Hey, Debbie Johnson, good morning. So if you have your Bible and you want to read this out loud with me, I would love to hear you read with me. So 1 Corinthians 7 verse, 7 verse 12 says, To the rest I say this, I not the Lord. If my brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer, and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. Hmm, interesting scriptures, right? As we, as we study and talk about living with an unbelieving spouse and how we do that. And what I think, first thing that hit me as I read this, um, this verse is how important communication is <laughs> and how many of us even think about saying to a spouse, you know, like I've changed. I believe in Jesus now. Do you still want to live with me? <laughs> Do we ever have that conversation, that communication? But one thing we need to see is that it's all up to the unbelieving spouse, the choice. The choice is up to the unbelieving spouse here. If the unbelieving spouse is willing to stay, wants to stay, loves that, that spouse enough to say, I still love you even though you've gotten weird on me, right? They still want to stay with them, then you stay married. So it's up to that unbelieving spouse, but that communication 
is really important. Hey, Linda, good morning. That communication is key. But it is clear that religion and, and not being yoked in the same faith and same belief really can cause those daily struggles with those daily decisions. Hey, Laura, good morning. I wrote on my post in my, um, my article on wordsbyindylee.com. I got this from, um, I think it was from the Huffington Post. I don't remember. Um, but the quote is from Naomi Riley. And she says, But religion affects things that affect our marriages, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, how we raise our children. These are issues that can't be addressed once, she says, and then put into a drawer. These are issues that come up throughout the course of marriage. And so that's why when you're not, when you don't, you're not on the same, you know, wavelength spiritually and in faith. But according to the scripture, and as, you know, to the rest, I say, so he's saying, this is my opinion. This is my, this is my, what I believe the Lord Torah or in the scriptures this is what I believe he says if any brother has a wife who's not a believer and she's willing to live with him he must not leave her scripture is such grace the grace of God just the grace of God that you are not um, that there is there's a way out here for the unbeliever at least not so much the believer but for the unbeliever but how important the communication is Go with me. Look at the other scriptures because they're really interesting. Um, verse 14, it explains it. For it says, For the unbelieving husband, I have to say hi to Laura. Hey, Laura, good to see you, my friend. 14, 1 Corinthians 7, 14. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified. I know. Hold on with me here. We're going to talk about this. For the unbelieving husband, this is why we need to stay with him. If they're willing to stay for the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband otherwise your children would be unclean but as it is they are holy oh yeah but on the brakes what the heck does that mean does that mean that they are saved under our marriage that our children are saved just because we are Believers. Well, I found some really interesting things as I dug down deep trying to find what this means. Hey, Steve, good morning. Uh, what I found is uh, the word sanctified here, that that word is used in Jewish language and the Jewish teachings um, to also mean a spouse or to be married or to be adopted or supported or, or taken under, you know, under like protection umbrella of things. And so it's not so much that they are sanctified as in salvation, because later on in verses, in verses 16, it says, how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how will you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So, so don't stay, stick with them even if they don't want to be with you because you're trying to save them because you don't know because it's up to their decision to come to Christ. So that word sanctification, I see it as, I see it as still being married with you, being in the family of a believer. It is a blessing to those who are positioned under your faith. They are positioned under your umbrella of faith. The Lord is blessing you and they will be, be, be blessed because they are underneath. They are adopted and they are supported by you and therefore they are receiving that those blessings. I mean, just think about it. Just think. I, I, know, I know that by the way we live and how we live with Jesus, that we live with peace, this, Think about the fruits of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness. Hey, you're living with somebody who's got the Spirit in them. The fruit of the Spirit is just coming out of them. Whew, 
then you can be blessed by that, right? You can be living under that blessing, uh, under that umbrella. So I see it not so much that they are going to be saved because they are married to you, nor your children saved because you are a believing mama, but boy, how it affects the relationships and it, it can soften their heart and it can bless them. They can see the blessings of being a believer. They receive that. And so he keeps on to say, but if the unbeliever, verse 15, hi, Marie Brown, good morning. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. Now, did you hear that? If the unbeliever says, I don't want to have any part of this marriage, and they leave, let them go. And it's okay. And you're still blessed. And you'll, you're still under God's covering. And I know, I know there's some of you watching today that this has happened. I pray you hear the grace of God and the love of God in these words. God has called us to live in peace. God has called us to live in peace. Hi, Emmanuel. Good morning. God has called us to live in peace. And Lori says, this verse gave her peace. Amen. Amen. Because um, what you're going to do? So you let them let go because God is faithful. And he is our husband. He is our maker. He is with us. He is our source. Who is your source? Who is your source? Is it your spouse? If your spouse is your source, then you need to do some digging because they are just human and they can only fill us up so much. <laughs> they cannot fill up the God hole that's inside of us. Only God can do that. And can I just tell you, when your husband doesn't do exactly what you want him to do or your wife isn't doing exactly what you need her to do, can you just say, Thank you, Jesus, because only you can. This makes me go back to the Lord as my source. Our husbands, our, our, our wives, our spouses, our children, my friends, are the icing on the cake. God has to be our source first and foremost. If we're trying to get the source from anybody else, it's going to be bad. I mean, it's hard on them. It's bad on you. God must be our source. So we must live our lives in such a way that we're a blessing to those around us. And that's where I see the big picture of this, that those who are, those we are married to, our children, as they live with us, that we are living our lives in such a way as believers, um, filled with the fruit of the Spirit, it just eking out of us, that it's blessing those around us, um, the Holy Spirit. I'm giving away my Ruth Bible study at the end of this week, and I wanted to read a little bit um, out of it to you, but first I wanted us to go to Ruth. Hey, Alicia, good to see you. So go with me to Ruth 1.16. So in Ruth 1, now this is not, this is, you know, this isn't a marriage. These are, these are two, Two women here, We I, I don't know if you know the story, but in case you don't, really quickly, what's happened is um, there's a Jewish family that lived in Bethlehem, Naomi and her family, and they moved to this awful town called Moab, and Moab was a really bad place. They moved there because there was a famine. And so they moved to Moab. It was not a Jewish place. They they worshipped the god Kamash, they they sacrificed children. It was a yucky place, and there's much more to that story. But while they're there, Naomi's husband dies, her sons marry Moabite women, and one of them is Ruth. And the sons die, and now they have nobody. And Naomi decides she has to go back home. She has to go back to her place of faith, back to Bethlehem. That um, I, I believe at that point... The famine was over, and she said, I've got to go back. And so she's going back home, and the girls are going back with her, and she stops in the middle of the road, and she says, I can't do this. I can't do this. you got to go back. you got to go back to Moab because I can't give you a son. I can't give you, I mean, I can't give you, I can't have another son for you to be married to. I can't give you anything. You need to go back to your family. 
One of the girls decides to go back, but Ruth says no. And I want you to I want you to hear what she says in Ruth one Ruth one sixteen. It says but Ruth replied you or turned back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely if anything but death separates you and me. If when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Did you hear what Ruth said? Now, Ruth, Ruth had a decision to make. I see this as Naomi had said, I, I'm turning back to my faith. In, in marriages, many times, I think, uh, people get married and one person perhaps grew up in the church and had left their faith for a little bit, but then came back to the Lord. And so, you know, it makes some problems in the marriage because now they're a believer and the other one is not, but they've gone back to their faith. Here, Naomi has, is going back home to the place of her faith. And she says, you don't have to go with me. You don't have to go. You're released. And Ruth says, uh-uh, I'm not going to go. What I love about this is I believe that Ruth had seen the faith of Naomi and her family. That even though they lived in Moab, an awful place, they had gone as sojourners, which means they had gone to that place to live as foreigners. And they meant to go back home. They never meant to stay. They meant to live, live as foreigners. That meant they were going to still hold on to their Jewish faith. They were still, they were still celebrate, celebrating Passover and all the festivals. They were celebrating their their God and their faith. I'm sure they said the Shema every morning. And so Ruth had seen this incredible faith in this incredible God. And she was not going back home to Moab. She was clinging to Ruth and saying, I want what you have. I want your God. I'm going to believe in your God. I'm claiming your God. So I want to read a little bit from my Bible study. I love how, um, you know, she says the word, she says, um, I don't urge me to go back because I believe in your Elohim. She said, your people will be my people in your Elohim my Elohim, your creator, my creator. And then she calls him Lord, that you're Lord. And that word Lord meant master. And so God goes from, she's claiming and the one true God. And then she claims her faith in him being her Lord and her master. It's an interesting regression. First, we recognize the one true God who created um, created all of us and then acknowledging his redemptive powers and plans and finally coming to know him as the master of our life. And then it says, you know, it says that Naomi finally was like, okay, I just give up. The girl is going with me. I love that wording there. It says, because Ruth was determined to go, Naomi stopped urging her. And when I hear that word determined, in the, in the Hebrew, it's a mass. And a mass means determined, strong, courageous, and bold. That girl was going and she was not turning around. She was going with Naomi. And I can't help but feel she was holding on to her and going because she was desperate. She was desperate. She was not going back to that sinful place. She was desperate to go to the place of Naomi's faith. It was desperate love. Once we've tasted the, the love, Elohim provided resilience and fortitude to take care of her mother-in-law once they arrived in Bethlehem. However, her determination to stay with Naomi proves more than goodness to me. It proves desperate love. She had stumbled on a treasure and she was not letting go. Oh, that was to live our lives as believers in such a way, in such a way 
in such a way of peace, of love, of kindness, of goodness, that those around us would want it too, right? That we would have that grace. My friends, we've got to trust God. He's writing our story. If in your story, your spouse has said, I don't want to have anything to do with this and left, God is good and he is faithful. Trust him in writing your story. He's got a plan and he's got a purpose of good proportions for us. Go back to 1 Corinthians 7. For the unbelieving, verse 14, husband, oh, I'm sorry, verse 12. To the rest I say, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she's willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. Friends, communicate. Talk. Talk to one another. Tell each other where you're at <laughs> in your faith and your love for one another. Find what you still have in common together. Remember those days that you fell in love and why you married that person in the first place. I remember with with our marriage, Mike and I were believers when we got married. He was a new believer. I was the one who had returned back to my faith. And I had been called into ministry in college, but when I got married to Mike Lee, I had set that calling aside. I thought maybe I misheard it or I was wrong. Um, so long story for me to work at a church and, and to go to school. And I, I said to Mike, I don't know if this is really fair to you because I didn't really tell you when we got married that I felt called to preach and teach and go into the ministry. And he was just so sweet. He said, I've known that. I've known it all along. The importance here is that we communicated and we talked about it and we sat down. Don't just hide it. Don't just push it under the rug, but have a, just a good heart to heart talk about where you are in your faith, why you're staying together, why you love each other, as, and know that as you are connected and staying connected, married to this unbeliever who has chosen to stay with you, that God's got something good and planned for this union, and that he's working. He is working in the process. You can't change him. You can't, you can't save him. Only God can do that. But you can love him, and you can show him the love and the grace and the kindness of Jesus. Hold my hands. I'm going to pray you up. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for your grace in our marriages. Lord, help us sit down and have those deep, those hard conversations. Lord, I, I pray for your grace in those conversations. I pray, Lord, that we would come to just, if we're struggling in our marriages, that we would remember why we married that person in the first place, why we fell in love, that for both the unbeliever and the believer, that they would remember. I pray, Lord, for peace in the marriages. That's what you've called us to. So I do pray for peace. I pray for protection. And if there is, we didn't talk about abuse, but if there's abuse going on, Lord, that there would be uh, safety and, and wisdom in that, Lord, and there would be help to intervene in that. Um, so we thank you, Lord, for your, again, again, your grace and for this word. And I do pray for all the marriages and the marriages to come of those who are watching today that they would be blessed by you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Y'all, I love y'all. Thanks so much for joining me today. Go to Words by Andy Lee, and I give you four things to do. If you are married to an unbeliever, I give you four things to do to help you in that struggle and in that marriage. Our next um, bite for tomorrow is Ephesians 5.33. So come on back. Bring your coffee. Join me tomorrow as we keep on digging deep to live fully. Go out there and be a threat to the enemy by your kindness and your love for your spouse. I'll see you later. Bye.